And welcome to Space Week Live, episode 141, on this Sunday, November 27th, 2022. Uh, so, I wanted to start off this week's episode by uh, introducing a new sister channel that now exists called uh, Raw Earth 8K. Now, as you may be aware, if you have spent any time on this channel, I really love satellite time lapses. Uh, satellite time-lapse videos, or as I call them, slow-mo time-lapses, which are uh, time-lapse videos which use AI interpolation to fill in extra frames to make them a little bit slower and a little bit more smooth. Uh, and so these are featured every day, 24-7, on my Chill Space stream, which uh, is where you, you, know, you hear my uh, library of copyright free music and uh, with the live chat and everything. But anyway, I wanted to introduce you to uh, Raw Earth 8K. So for the last couple of years, I have been accumulating um, uh, loads of very high resolution satellite time-lapse videos. Uh, now, lower resolution versions of these are featured in my Chill Space stream. But I have always wanted to be able to, uh, I've wanted a place to put the full resolution, uh, 8K, uh, what is it, 70 something, anyway, it's ridiculous resolution. It's, it's uh, four times, four it's four times 4K resolution. Uh, basically, nobody, almost nobody has a monitor uh, uh, with sufficient resolution to display this at max res. However, I wanted to be able to upload the videos somewhere but I didn't want to flood my main raw space channel uh, with these because there are a lot of them. And I didn't want to dilute the, uh, the launch streams and the other edited videos and things like that and the space weeks and whatnot. Uh, so I created Raw Earth 8K. It's just uh, youtube.com slash at sign Raw Earth 8K. And so uh, this channel will feature, or does feature, uh, the first few of what will become a great many um, satellite time lapses. Now, they may uh, look a little repetitious, but that's because um, we only have one world, and it spins in a very 
predictable manner. Uh, the, the clouds can do interesting things, but uh, day to day, the overall view of the world is largely the same. But um, uh, what I've done is I've uploaded the first few um, goes east satellite time lapses. So each video encompasses one month of time. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've arranged them into playlists, uh, which are in chronological order. So if you, if you play the playlist, um, it will play in sequence. And so the end of one month will flow into the beginning of the next month. Now this here is playing at, I presume, 4K resolution, uh, because that's what I'm streaming at. But um, uh, in any case, the full resolution is 8K. So I wanted to upload these kind of in raw format without any uh, advertising or intros or outros, uh, not only so that the, this, the sequence of videos could play back to back, but also so that people can use these uh, for their own purposes, uh, so long as they provide uh, credit to raw space, since I did the uh, uh, the time lapse um, the, the time lapse video processing myself. Uh, there's actually a huge process that goes into creating these because um, the 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 source images come down from various satellites, goes east, goes west, uh, Himawari eight, uh, which is over the, the Western Pacific, and uh, the Electro L2 Russian satellite, which is over the East Atlantic, um, and potentially other satellites as well. Uh, Discover Epic, or the Discover satellite, which is uh, orbiting Earth at the, uh, or it's kind of hovering between the Sun and the Earth at the, the Sun Earth L1 Lagrange point, uh, or in a, in a halo orbit around the, the Lagrange point. Um, but, uh, in any case, these videos, um, uh, the source images are huge resolution. They're 11,000 pixels by 11,000 pixels approximately. And so I download these from multiple satellites, uh, every day from, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, or administration rather, uh, CIRA, which is a division of the University of Colorado, um, and the Himawari 8 images come from uh, this organization called Digital Typhoon, which does automatic color correction of the images because the, the original source images are, uh, uh, they're not quite RGB, like they're not quite the same color wavelengths that our eyes would see because uh, the purpose of the satellites is not to look pretty, not to produce pretty images, but rather to gather useful data about agriculture, weather systems, uh, atmospheric movements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the wavelengths of light that are being gathered by these satellites don't quite correspond with the wavelengths of light that we see. And so there has to be a kind of color mapping uh, to get from the data, the, the raw data that the satellite brings down to something that's that appears roughly how we would see it if we were looking at it from space. And so I have scripts that download all these images every day. Uh, and then at the end of every month, I have to go back and uh, collate them and pro like weed out the, the bad images, try to fill in any gaps that are there. Uh, and then I process them into uh, a number of different time lapses, including this sort of overview uh, slow-mo time-lapse that we see here, which is with the, um, the uh, slow-motion interpolation ap applied. Uh, in any case, um, so now that I have officially launched my uh, Raw Earth 8K channel, that is where I will be dumping the full UHD 8K resolution uh, time-lapses that, um, that you're accustomed to seeing in my Chill Space stream. Uh, and I also had, I also concocted a, uh, a, a very handy script that automatically injects the videos with randomized copyright free music. 
So I have my copyright free music library that, that I play for all of my streams. And um, this script will uh, gather a random collection of those songs and inject them into the videos so that I can upload them to the, uh, the Raw Earth 8K channel. Uh, because I figure people would rather uh, hear music than silence. So anyway, I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to uh, that channel. Feel free to subscribe and uh, put it on in the background or whatever you whatever you care to do. All right. So looking back at the events of the past week, uh, last Monday the Artemis One mission Orion spacecraft arrived at the moon after an approximately five day journey. Um, having launched from Pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center, uh, Orion swung around the moon, as, and what we're seeing now is a uh, slightly sped up view from the live stream of when Orion was about to pass beyond the far side of the moon. Uh, and so what we're seeing is, uh, you could call it Earth set. It is the setting of the Earth from the perspective of the Orion spacecraft. And of course, without a line, of, without a direct line of sight to the Earth and without any, um, any relay satellites that can relay the signal from Orion to the Earth. Um, oh, and that was it. So if we go back, oop, let's go back a few frames there. Um, without a sa any satellites that can relay the signal from Orion to the Earth, there's no way uh, for Orion to communicate its, its uh, video or images or data to the Earth when it's on the far side of the moon. <clears throat> uh, what it has to do is uh, cache all of that or, or just gather it together, save it, and then transmit it uh, once it is within line of sight of the Earth. And so the Apollo missions, um, many years ago, they uh, entered lunar orbit with the command module, uh, but they entered lunar orbit near the equatorial plane, near the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth, uh, uh, the plane of the uh, perpendicular to the moon's axis of rotation. And uh, that is sort of the easy, uh, sort of getting to the moon easy mode, um, whereas Artemis 1 is occupying what they call a distant retrograde orbit. It's an orbit uh, more around the, the, the south pole of the moon that takes, it's an elliptical orbit that takes it far away from the moon and then comes back again. And so... Um, uh, the idea being that it will bring the spacecraft close to uh, the Shackleton Crater uh, landing site, which is where we plan to land, uh, aroundabouts where we plan to land uh, Artemis 3 in a few years, 2025-ish. Uh, so Artemis 2 will be crewed, but they won't land, and then Artemis 3 will be crewed and they will land for the first time in in uh, uh, 56 ish years. So, um, so Artemis did swing around the backside of the moon. Unfortunately, it's uh, because it was out of contact at the time of its closest approach, which was uh, something like 80 miles from the surface of the moon. Uh, and during its, uh, during its flyby uh, burn, it, uh, we did not get live views during the closest approach uh, because it was out of sight on the far side of the moon. Uh, but it has since, uh, you know, it, it, a short time later, it emerged from the other side of the moon. We were able to communicate with it again, and we've been tracking it ever since. Now, there hasn't been a lot of uh, coverage by NASA of this very important mission, which I discussed a little bit last week which is puzzling because of the, the uh, importance, the historic nature, and the expense of this mission. Uh, but nonetheless, um, 
uh, it is happening. We are about midway through the mission. And uh, uh, just for a sense of, of perspective, um, Artemis will be leaving lunar orbit on December 7th, headed for a splashdown on December 11th. So Artemis is proceeding, and uh, uh, feel free to check the Artemis or NASA's Artemis 1 website for the latest updates, uh, images. There is a live tracker out there if you want. I mean, a live, uh, well, there are live trackers. There's a live tracker website, as well as live views from the, uh, uh, the spacecraft as it, as it circles around the moon. Now again, it's not in a close, tight orbit around the moon. It's in a, it's in a, um, uh, a distant orbit uh, that brings it up to forty thousand kilometers past the moon, and then in close in for its for its flyby of the southern pole or whatever. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, there we have the current status of Artemis. And there are a couple of Artemis events coming up this uh, later this week, which I'll get to in that part of the broadcast. Let's see. Also, also on Monday, ABL Space Systems made a second attempt to launch their RS-1 rocket. Unfortunately, that does not stand for Ross Space One. As with their first attempt a few days earlier, the terminal count was auto-aborted during the ignition sequence at T minus one point something seconds. ABL has not provided any additional info about the cause of the aborts, and the next launch window <clears throat> will be on December 7th. Last Tuesday, SpaceX launched the Utilsat 10B communication satellite. Unlike most Falcon 9 launches, extra thrust was needed to place the large satellite into its geostationary transfer orbit, so the first stage booster was expended. Rather than propulsively landing itself on a drone ship, it performed a deorbit burn and splashed down somewhere in the ocean. Uh, consequently, the booster had no landing legs or titanium grid fins. Here's the launch. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and full power, and lift off the Falcon 9, go to that 10B, go 1049. Vehicle's missing that range. Stage 1 propulsion is nominal. wiggly during the uh, during the ascent I don't know if they have that camera mounted on a uh, on a lightning one of the lightning towers or or what but it could use a bit of stabilization now during ascent the m1d engines will actually swivel and help steer Falcon 9 this is known as gimbal the rocket autonomously tilts the engines just a few degrees looking good and here's the satellite deployment, sped up a bit. Uh, now the rocket's upper stage introduced some spin to stabilize the satellite, but uh, then it used its RCS thrusters to immediately stop itself spinning uh, right after separation. So I don't know if you noticed in the background, the Earth was kind of spinning. That's um, the spin stabilization that they, that they gave the satellite, and then the rocket canceled that out immediately thereafter. And note the altitude. This is at 1,400 kilometers plus, uh, much higher than, than uh, oh, <laughs> much higher than we normally see Falcon, uh, uh, Falcon 9 launches go. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was an Ariane Space 
Vega C launch scheduled for last Thursday, but it was postponed when they uh, when defective equipment was detected during the rocket's arming sequence. Uh, the launch, the Vega C launch, has been pushed out to December twentieth. So we'll get to that in a few weeks. On Friday, there was supposed to be a Russian spacewalk to move a radiator from the Rosviet module to the Nauka laboratory module, but it was postponed as well. And I think that the postponement of that spacewalk had a cascading effect on some other spacewalks as well, which we'll talk about later. On Saturday, an Indian PSLV rocket launched the EOS-6 Earth Observation Satellite. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off normal. There's the textbook lift off of PSL C fifty four zero zero six mission. Now, if you're not familiar, PSLV stands for Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, and that's the uh, the smallish to medium lift vehicle that uh, developed by ISRO that uh, they use for launching satellites into sun synchronous and polar orbits, as one might deduce from the name. Uh, also on Saturday, SpaceX launched the Dragon CRS-26 cargo mission to the ISS. Go. To my 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, engine full power, and lift off of CRS 26, go Falcon, and happy Thanksgiving ISS. That's right, lift off of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket for the 26th cargo resupply mission bringing new science experiments and solar arrays to the International Space Station. Now, in Dragon's trunk, or the unpressurized cargo area at the bottom of the spacecraft, were two more IROSAs, or ISS Rollout Solar Arrays. These new, these new solar panels will be, will be installed... Uh, oh. Well, that was unceremonious. These um, <laughs> new solar panels will be installed during spacewalks over the next couple of weeks to further augment the space station's power generation capabilities. Uh, Dragon arrived at the space station about 17 hours later, early this morning, my time. Now here we see the view from Dragon's docking mechanism as it approached the Harmony module's zenith or space-facing port. In the background, we see some gorgeous city lights as ISS flew directly over Tokyo, Japan. Right there is Tokyo. It's kind of perfect timing. Also on Sunday morning, a Chinese Long March 2D launched the third Yaogan 36 satellite from Xichang Satellite Launch Center. unmute myself. That's the launches of the past week. Uh, now, looking further back into the annals of space history, this Friday will mark the 29th anniversary of the first Hubble servicing mission. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched in April 1990. Within weeks of its deployment, a major flaw in its optics was detected. 
The primary reflecting mirror had been precisely ground, but to the wrong shape. Its outer perimeter was too flat by about 2200 nanometers. That's 1 450th of a millimeter, or 1 11,000th of an inch. That might not sound like much, but it caused enough spherical aberration to prevent Hubble from achieving anything close to a sharp focus. It wouldn't have been feasible to replace the giant mirror in orbit, so a solution was devised to give Hubble corrective optics that counteracted or cancelled out the flaw in the mirror, kind of like wearing a pair of glasses. On December 2nd, 1993, the Space Shuttle Endeavour launched on its STS-61 mission to fix the ailing telescope. It was the most complex shuttle mission to date, involving spot five spacewalks over ten days. Astronauts installed a new main camera, the Wide Field and Planetary Camera 2, and a corrective optics package called CoStar. They also installed new solar arrays and performed instrument upgrades. There were a total of five Hubble servicing missions, the last one in 2009. No additional servicing missions are planned, nor would any be possible at this time, since the remaining space shuttle fleet was retired in 2011. Neither Soyuz nor Crew Dragon has an airlock, so humanity is currently incapable of conducting any EVAs in space other than at the International or Chinese space stations. Looking ahead to this week, uh, let's see. On Monday, November 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2200 UTC is an Artemis One mission status briefing to discuss the the uh, Orion spacecraft's current status at the midpoint of the mission. Now, this is being broadcast by NASA. I will have a copy for you here on Raw Space uh, so that you can engage in chat with your with your favorite peeps. Tuesday. Uh, November 29th at 10.10 a.m. Eastern, 15.10 UTC, is a Long March 2F launch from Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China with the next uh, three Chinese Taikonauts bound for the Chinese space station. Now, there may be live coverage of this, um, and if so, I will try to provide it for you. But if not, then... Uh, you can catch the replay later on. Possibly also on Tuesday at uh, possibly 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, midnight UTC, is the Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 rocket with the Start Me Up mission taking off from the UK. Now, I say possibly because there was only one launch schedule website with this listed, and this particular schedule on November 29th might have just been a placeholder. Sometimes these, these scheduling websites, they just kind of kick the can down the road. When a mission is postponed, they, they move the scheduled launch to like the end of the month or around the end of the month, and, uh, uh, and then leave it there rather than taking it down and you know taking the scheduled item down and then updating it when they have concrete information so there's no information from virgin orbit uh on this launch uh nor from any other scheduling website that i was able to find but this will be a significant uh, when it does happen this will be a significant launch because uh, it will be the first time ever that an orbital rocket launch will have originated from British soil. Now, this is a Virgin Orbit launch, and the, the Launcher 1 is an air-launched rocket. It rides under the wing, or under the, you know, under the wing of a Boeing 747 aircraft. Uh, and so they take off from a runway uh, in the UK, and uh, then they fly out over the ocean, and then they release uh, the rocket. So it's not actually going to be launching over British soil, but it will have originated from British soil. Eh, it's kind of splitting hairs. 
But uh, in any case, there's never actually been an orbital launch uh, from Great Britain before. Uh, England has had orbital uh, class rockets, but they have launched from Australia, not from the UK. <clears throat> On Wednesday, November 30th, at 3.39 a.m. Eastern, 0839 UTC, is the launch of a SpaceX Falcon 9 with iSpace Mission 1, also called Hakuto-R. This is a, a pretty cool lunar landing mission uh, from Japan. So iSpace is a Japanese uh, company that had been developing a lunar mission for the Google Lunar X Prize, but when the time limit expired on that prize, they, re, um, they restructured the mission and it became the uh, Hakuto-R Mission 1. And it will be uh, uh, landing, where will it be landing? Targeting a landing in Lacus Somnorium, Somniorum region of the moon. So there's also a lunar flashlight CubeSat, which will be a ride share on that mission. Uh, now, unfortunately, because it's launching at 3.39 in the morning, my time, I will not have a live stream for you, but you can catch it on the SpaceX channel if you wish. Uh, also possibly launching <clears throat> on Wednesday is a Russian Soyuz 2.1A rocket with Fregat M upper stage with the Nitron 2 or the Nitron number 2 mission. Um, this is a military satellite. will be launching from Plesetsk Cosmodrome in the far north of Russia and there will not be live coverage. At the very same time, uh, Wednesday, November 30th at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC, is the second of two Artemis One mission updates this week. It's a preview of the upcoming lunar escape uh, uh, maneuver and the uh, return trip and splashdown. So this is this update is on November 30th, and then uh, I misspoke earlier. The retrograde orbit departure is not December 7th. It's actually December 1st, which is uh, this coming Thursday, and then uh, the splashdown is on December 11th. On possibly on Friday, December 2nd, at 7 p.m. Eastern, midnight UTC, is the maiden flight of Zhukuo 2, a Chinese, a, a new Chinese rocket that has been in development. Now, this launch has been delayed from March, July, and September, and I say that this is a possible launch because, um, again, this is the the end of the month, beginning of the next month, and this is a, a, uh, a mission that's been postponed a few times, and so this entry, which was only present on one of the multiple scheduling sites I used to aggregate my launch schedules, uh, was only on one of them, and so I'm thinking it, it also might be a placeholder, but uh, in any case, I'm not expecting live coverage from the Chinese uh, test flight so uh, whether it does or doesn't launch won't really matter until it actually does, <laughs> at which point I'll be able to uh, hopefully have a replay for you during the subsequent space week. Now, coming up on Saturday, De uh, December 3rd at 6 a.m. Eastern, 1100 UTC, is U.S. Spacewalk 82, to install uh, one of the new IROSAs, the new solar arrays, on the ISS. Now, this one will go on the Starboard 4 truss of the, I of the International Space Station. Um, so the live coverage starts at 6 a.m. with the spacewalk uh, scheduled to begin about 85 minutes after that. Now, bear in mind, sometimes the spacewalks don't start on time. Uh, the last one was more than an hour late starting, but um, uh, in any case, 
Once they do get started, uh, the spacewalk should last about seven hours. Now, this spacewalk was scheduled for earlier in the week, but it was pushed out a few days. Uh, similarly, there was the next spacewalk, so Spacewalk 83, which had originally been scheduled for this Saturday, but it was pushed out until later in December because it got bumped by some other, uh, well, by some Russian spacewalks that are coming up next week. So, um, let me see. That, uh, that about wraps it up for the for next week, or rather for this week. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our Stalwart channel supporters who have stuck with us through thick and thin. And um, if you're interested in showing your support for the channel, well, first of all, uh, if you don't want to show support monetarily, it's still hugely helpful if you uh, can like the video and subscribe to the channel. That helps uh, tell YouTube that people enjoy this content and will uh, uh, encourage the almighty algorithm to show my streams to, uh, to more people and, and get more folks in the door. But if you do wish to show you support monetarily, there are a number of options. Uh, there is Patreon. There are channel memberships right here on YouTube if you click the Join button. There is uh, PayPal for direct contributions, and of course, the Walmart merch store with uh, uh, nifty merchandise such as t-shirts, mugs, and even backpacks and pillows. All right, let me get to your questions. Hopefully the script collated them. Uh, the Cheesy Princess, what does your t-shirt say? So this is not a t-shirt in the raw space store, but um, it is one that I happen to be wearing. It says, sarcasm may occur periodically. And it's in uh, the uh, chemical elements uh, <laughs> font, I guess. <laughs> so what do we got? Sodium, argon, calcium, and SM. What is that? Selenium? I don't even know. But... Uh, yeah, that's what it says. All right. Uh, MD says, I'm afraid my screen can only handle 4K slash 2160p. Uh, yeah, that is perfectly fine. So can so can mine. Um, I actually I, I actually started editing 4K videos before uh, I even had a 4K monitor, but um, I do have 4K monitors now, but now I'm editing 8K videos and I don't have 8K, so I can't even see the, mon the, the videos in their full resolution. <clears throat> Tom Darko, uh, any timeline on Dream Chaser? I'm afraid I don't have any news regarding Dream Chaser. Uh, I haven't heard anything lately, but uh, um, if I do hear something, or if you do, if you do hear something that you would like me to include in a future space week, please make sure to um, either post it on Discord, which I'll post the Discord link in the chat, or message me via some mechanism. Uh, you can leave it in a you know, video comment or a uh, direct message or whatever. All right. Uh, Julian, how many satellites are at the moon? Ooh. Well, there's the Orion spacecraft, of course. Um, as for what do we have orbiting the moon, I don't know, I suppose I could Google it. Um, what satellites are orbiting the, the moon? Because, let's see. All right, category, satellites orbiting the moon. No, no, no. Uh, this is from years ago. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Well, I don't have a concise list handy for you, but uh, somewhere out there, there's a web page listing the, sa the uh, satellites that are currently orbiting the moon. And I don't know if it's more than just the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, and Orion, but, uh, but some Google Foo could, could yield that result for you. 
Um, MD says maybe they can launch a separate airlock module. So the, the yes, uh, an airlock for current crewed spacecraft, um, you know, Dragon, Soyuz, uh, the the, Ch the Chinese crewed spacecraft could be developed, but none currently exists. And as we're all familiar, it takes a long time. A lot of money and a lot of delays to uh, develop, test, certify, and uh, deploy new space systems. Um, and so in order to give, like, let's say, for example, a Crew Dragon spacecraft an airlock capability, uh, I am not even sure how that would work. Maybe because because of the the physical form factor of the vehicle, uh, it's possible that the airlock would have to be launched prior to the crew capsule, and then the crew capsule could effectively dock to it, like uh, the space station, like the uh, the Dragon spacecraft docks to the space station. Um, Maybe an airlock could be carried up in the trunk of the Crew Dragon, except without doing an EVA, uh, Crew Dragon has no way to get uh, objects from inside the trunk out of the trunk and deploy them. Like the, the, the Crew Dragon doesn't have a robotic arm like the ISS does. And we don't have any little space robots that can, like little space tugs that can uh, zoom around and and grab things and move them. Uh, so I think the only way that you could conduct an EVA from, let's say, a crew, a crew Dragon would be to launch some sort of airlock module beforehand and then send Crew Dragon up there to dock with it uh, and then have it undock you know, later on once the EVA was complete, which is totally feasible, but that would be an entirely new system a new sort of mini spacecraft, uh, a, an airlock spacecraft, if you will. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of any such things uh, in development. That would be useful, but yeah, <laughs> that's just my <laughs> layman's perspective on the matter. Uh, let's see. Balaz Nemeth, raw space, why do spacewalks take so long? Well, um, first of all, it takes a long time for the astronauts to... Basically, everything in space is slow. I mean, except for launch and re-entry. Everything else in space uh, is slow. You know, it takes the astronauts a long time to suit up. It takes, a, it takes a long time to bring the airlock down to vacuum and test for leaks. Then once they get out, they have to um, either through uh, manually translating or moving down the length of the station or by using the, uh, the robotic arm to sort of move them around. Um, they have to get to the work site. You know, they have to inventory their tools and do glove and hap checks, which is the helmet absorption pad on the back of their helmet that they they use to make sure there are no uh, leaks happening in the suit. Um, you know, they they uh, they have to conduct their whatever maintenance or installation or operations they're doing in the spacewalk. They have to do it in zero gravity um, or in free in weightless weightlessness, which is difficult because you have you know you don't have gravity grounding you so that you have any like leverage like if you're trying to drive a bolt into something when you apply any pressure on that uh, pistol grip tool which is their fancy like power drill thing or power driver um like if you push on that you're going to move away from the station so you, you know you've got to like grab with one hand and push with this hand and um it's just everything you do in space is laborious 
and except for just floating, like floating takes no effort at all, which is nice. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, getting done a task that would take maybe a half hour here on earth, it takes, you know, seven hours up in up in space because there's just so much overhead to, to uh, doing anything up there. Uh, it's just like, <clears throat> You know, approaches and dockings and undockings, uh, they take it very slow and steady. Now, NASA takes an extra cautious approach. Um, you know, Roscosmos, not quite as cautious. You know, they, they have a more of a fire from the hip kind of methodology, but uh, and they're, they're less risk averse. They're willing to accept more risk in uh, the kind of operations they do. But... Um, but so long as NASA's involved, there will be an abundance of, of risk aversedness. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So Julian Rossbase, does Google have a map of the moon? Uh, yeah, I believe that Google maps, or at least either Google maps or Google earth, Google earth in any case, I believe they do have maps of all of the planets that you can uh, roam around. Um, I think it is Google Earth, not Google Maps, but uh, uh, yes, they certainly do. All right, Irwin says, Google says there are currently four satellites ob orbiting the moon. Sounds about right. Uh, VL Storm Tracker says he wishes he could support through, or they wish they, they could support through Patreon, but uh, that site is not supported from their country, which I believe is Trinidad and Trinidad and Tobago, if if that's the correct pronunciation. Um, so I don't know if from Trinidad you can use uh, YouTube memberships if that's allowed, or um, if not that, then perhaps PayPal. Um, but yeah, there are some countries where um, monetary support options just aren't going to work. Like we have, you know, regulars on the channel that live in Russia and they can't, they can't do anything like the, <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> um, the financial transactions between countries, uh, are just not, not available for some places. But, uh, all right. Any more questions? Elmo Jones, any thoughts on the 45 minute communication breakdown? Um, I don't recall which communication breakdown you're referring to. Like what was that during, uh, or was it during an event, uh, like a rendezvous event or, or just during the course of, uh, regular ISS operations. I'm not sure what you, what you're referring to. Oh, capstone. I'm sorry. I think I'm mixing my messages here. Uh, that's right, Capstone is orbiting the moon. All right. And looks like we're caught up on the questions. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can always ask either in the, uh, uh, the Chill Space live chat or on Discord which I'm linking in the chat. Uh, so thank you all for coming and keep it raw. Until next time, take care and see you later.